Okay, um, a really nice welcome to all of you. Um, this is really the the swan song almost of a program that lasted for the past five years, um, which is the Excel to Enough program um, funded by um, the European Union under the Horizon 2020 project. And this is a widening program. Um, the meaning of that is to really extend the science capability and capacity in countries um, that are tier two, um, in, which really includes Portugal um, as one of the front runners. And that is the program that got me um, from the UK um, to Portugal, um, a decision I absolutely do not regret. I have um, really very much enjoyed the past five years. Um, and certainly on the, the sustainment of this program, I have no plans of going anywhere. Um, so you will see me around hopefully for many more years. Um, one of the pillars of this program is certainly the internationalization. Um, so bringing in a somebody from outside, in this case, myself as a Dutch national um, to Portugal. And to me, it seemed really appropriate to organize a, a meeting in the end. And of course, being in the middle of a pandemic, the choice of subject was not, uh, not a surprise to anyone. Um, but to have two speakers that kind of connect a little bit in that way. So this is both international in the sense we have one speaker from the Netherlands. Um, so my home country, although um, I lived less than half my life there by now. And the second person is a Portuguese national, but is outside of the country, but is closely connected still with a lot of what we do. So the first speaker will be um, Marianne Koopmans. Um, a veterinary by training, um, but somebody extremely interested in how zoonotic viruses move from an animal to another animal, or what is happening, uh, what has happened now, going from a animal to a human being. Um, this mode of transmission, how this works, um, which receptors are involved, how viruses evolved is, is uh, absolutely uh, her interest. And I don't think we could have had anyone better, um, although I, I honestly, maybe Anthony Fauci would be still one step higher, but for the rest, I'm, I'm extremely happy that Marion decided to accept the invitation. Um, she's part of many EU networks, uh, an advisor of the WHO, um, but one of the, the, the things um, that I think makes it more appropriate than anyone else is she's been working on viruses especially coronaviruses, well before this became uh, fashionable and many others jumped on this in the past two years. Secondly, we have Rui Ribeiro, um, originally from training a mathematical biologist. Um, so this sounds a little bit uh, uh, quite different um, when we talk about the pandemic, but Rui has been instrumental in a lot of the work we have been doing in the past um, one and a half years, um, leading the analysis of the national serology surveys, for example, uh, calculating um, how to sample the national population, including all the regions in the country, what sample sizes we need, how to look at the data, um, which of the questionnaires we should use, um, and, and really uh, digging into that data to get the most out of it. And he will be certainly talking about that. He is now in Los Alamos uh, National Library in the United States, where he's interested in modeling viral diseases and how they interact with the immune system. So there you already see that there is not just a, a national interest, but this is really a scientific interest. And then his interests are in the pathogenesis of infection and how to model these things. Um, he has been uh, certainly no stranger to IMM and the Faculty of Medicine. He was here a professor of biostatistics um, from 2017 to 2020. So I don't want to make take any more of your time, um, but Marion, if you would like to start first, um, you can share your screen. And again, thank you very much accepting at once. It was really a great pleasure. My only interactions with you have been seeing little video clips on Dutch TV, television. Um, so it's really great to have you here in person. Thank you. Yes, thank you. And thanks for the invitation. Um, and let's see. So it's it's difficult. So these days, now that everyone really is an expert, <laughs> it's difficult to know what you know to put together that also is suitable for a broader a group so let me know if i succeeded and if not then let me know too um so my uh, 
talk that I put together is uh, titled Lessons Learned and Key Outstanding Questions. And I will walk through some of the elements that I think are uh, such. So what we are looking at is, uh, this is the situation in, in my country um, that after all this, you know, big, uh, big uh, restraining conditions in, in winter and in the past months, we are definitely seeing a let up in the circulation of this virus in Europe. Uh, I know that in, in Portugal, there is a bit of a resurgence because of the Delta variant, but Overall, we do see numbers going down, ICU impact going out, hospitalization impact going out, and in the different countries in Europe, a gradual lifting of uh, control measures. But um, while that is happening, uh, maybe not for the general community, but certainly for the research community, there are of course ongoing key questions. What will the winter look like? Um, and will that be uh, that question? Is that affected by which variants pop up? Um, can SARS CoV 2 be eliminated? And of course, also the question what happened really at the origin of this pandemic? And these are some of the topics that I will address. Now, um, projections, forward projections are notoriously difficult. Um, um, and that's also illustrated by this paper that was already uh, uh, published uh, early 2020 um, by a modeling group from Harvard, Harvard um, that actually said, well, depending on what we assume in terms of um, cross reactive uh, immunity or duration of specific immunity infection specific or vaccination specific immunity, uh, we expect to see either a single big wave, this was, mind you, this was in May uh, uh, 2020, either a single uh, uh, big wave and then fading out of this pandemic, uh, annual cycles or something in between. Pointing to the, cre uh, to the critical knowledge gaps that are uh, related to immunology questions. Now, of course, the, the landscape now, uh, when we ask the same question now, looking forward this winter is very different because of the, the fast track vaccine development, which if you plot it uh, like it was done here com in comparison. So here's the uh, SARS-CoV-2 vaccines. Here's other the timeline of other infectious disease vaccines it's even more amazing to see how that was done. And that's really because of an investment since uh, 2016 uh, under the RNA blueprint for action to prevent epidemics, which was an initiative that said there are diseases out there for which um, we're not going to see uh, the market develop uh, key countermeasures that needs to be picked up in a different uh, program. And that led to the spark of the CEPI program, which was working among others on coronavirus vaccines. So part of the explanation why that went so fast, but also uh, illustration of why this type of preparedness thinking is so crucial. Now where this pandemic really has also resulted in a total shift of how things are done is when we look at virus uh, genetics and virus genomics. So the, the size of the genome sequencing effort is, is really paling uh, anything that was done historically. Um, I've had uh, EU funding to really advocate for this and to develop infrastructures, platforms, tools, etc. And all of a sudden, this is the, the key approach that is adopted globally um, and will presumably also be uh, continued in the years to come. So of course with that there's a there's a uh, breakthrough for the use of pathogen genomics and that can be used and, and raises also uh, many questions. Um, can we actually uh, get better at predicting uh, behavior phenotypes from genomic data? Um, for instance, can we derive somehow from this type of data, how do these viruses transmit, who infected whom, have phenotypes changed, and how can we use this for policy support? I'm sorry for the typos here. 
So this is, of course, uh, something that uh, you uh, presumably are all familiar with, but here I want to point out that uh, one of the great things with this particular situation is that uh, while we see a big effort now in public health arenas, of course, the essentially the same toolbox can also be used to sample animals, environment, and really understand the, the interactions that this human animal environmental uh, ecosystem interface um, as one of the opportunities um, that, uh, that lies ahead of us. Uh, particularly also with the development of uh, the more fieldable sequencing uh, approaches that allow you to set up uh, sequencing in many parts of the of the world uh, shown here for this is Bas Aude Munich he's a, a postdoc in, in in my lab showing well he's here he's sequencing he's doing a project on a market in China here with the uh, uh, the Cadi team in uh, Brazil, uh, touring around to uh, to uh, try and understand the arbovirus profiles there, and here with a PhD student in Suriname to support their um, uh, public health effort by uh, providing uh, sequence data uh, to the public health uh, community. Now. Um, for that, of course, uh, we have to understand uh, what parts of uh, uh, the genome to look at. And currently, I think really the emphasis has been on understanding uh, spike uh, gene and spike protein diversity as the surface uh, protruding uh, protein that, of course, is critical for docking of the virus on host cells and also critical targets for immune response and also the key target in most currently developed vaccines. So that's an obvious uh, reason, but with the fast evolving global databases, understanding some of the rest of the diversity is going to be a big field in the years to come, I'm pretty sure. And just for reference, if you look at what is available now in terms of uh, coronavirus genomes, um, that's more than has been collected over 30 years of uh, flu surveillance and of HIV surveillance, for instance, massive effort. Um, okay, so I will walk you through some of the issues that we have worked on, um, starting here with uh, the search for the, you know, what exactly happened at the origin of this pandemic. And this year is a visit in uh, Wuhan. Uh, and uh, what you, you're looking at the clinician from a Chinese uh, traditional uh, hospital that uh, picked up the phone to the Wuhan CDC uh, when she had two patients, um, December 26 and 7 respectively, with a uh, type of pneumonia that she felt was really weird, was really different from what she'd been seen before. And this is a very experienced physician who's also experienced with uh, viral pneumonia surveillance, but she really said, this is something different. So she really uh, was the first one that uh, alerted us to uh, this new virus, which then, as you all know, was in, uh, in a matter of, of, well, a very short time course, um, isolated here with infected uh, cell uh, cultures and also uh, sequenced and that gave us the first uh, uh, hint at the position of this virus in the beta coronavirus uh, clade here, grouping with SARS-related coronaviruses, the, the diversity of SARS-related coronaviruses that has been sampled uh, before, and quite different from the known uh, human seasonal viruses. Crucial here was also the rapid sharing. This is the publication uh, on a preprint server, but the actual sequence was shared January 10. And that really was the date when all the vaccine and the diagnostic development efforts really started. So I think that's quite uh, good. So looking at that uh, uh, Sarbaco virus um, uh, grouping in, in more detailed, uh, detail, you see here the uh, SARS-1 coronavirus and a wide diversity of bat related, SARS related viruses that have been uh, identified mostly because of uh, surveys done in response to uh, the SARS CoV outbreak. Um, and that has demonstrated uh, from work by, by several 
investigators, but uh, also notably the Institute of Horology in Wuhan, just how much diversity is out there. And now here is our new uh, virus also matching closest to one of the viruses that had been picked up through one of through the, those um, uh, animal surveys in the past, and that's the RTG13 virus. Since then, uh, with uh, studies using historic samples from seized uh, animals, uh, these these pangolins. Um, from two separate occasions showed uh, that there's a deeper uh, routing to pangolin viruses. So suggesting these are their own uh, potential uh, reservoir, um, possibly with mixing of viruses between these. Uh, but what the paper also showed and what we know is that the distance between these closest relatives and SARS-CoV-2 still is in evolutionary terms, uh, several decades. So there's a big piece uh, missing here. And a lot of the uh, studies in uh, the China mission were really focused on trying to uh, understand the earliest events, first from reconstructing what exactly had been seen, and then also from studies asking whether there was an indication of earlier and maybe missed disease cases. So you're looking at one of those here. So this is a national notif disease notification system, which had recorded uh, 76,000 uh, cases from uh, over 200 health facilities. And all of these have been reviewed, the patient charts by clinical teams to see if they, there were patients with that typical profile that the, um, uh, the physician that I just mentioned uh, uh, described. Um, and it showed a couple that, may, that fit that case definition, but when going back there and testing them for antibodies, all of them were negative. So no evidence from that endeavor. Cases confirmed were um, here. And as you can see, quite a few of them had exposure to the uh, famous or not so famous Huanan seafood market. Another study trying to see at, was there any indication for early missed widespread circulation is this one, which looks at excess mortality statistics by week. And this year, this is the, the map of uh, Wuhan. And you see the first uh, uh, start of a uh, period of increased mortality is by the second half of January. So really no, uh, so, and that, that from what we know now reflects widespread circulation in the weeks before, but not very several months earlier. There's no evidence for that. So here's where those cases, uh, the, the identified cases were located, centrally clustered again around the area where also one of the biggest markets was uh, located. And that's this, um, a fairly typical animal market with all these little uh, stalls, uh, which uh, sold a whole range of animals. So all of that was inventory. So here you look at the map of the market. These are 1,500 individual stalls selling aquatic products, um, uh, livestock meat, uh, wild animal meat, and poultry meat. Um, and the uh, initial cases were mapped to the market. And as you can see, most of the initial ones mapped to this west part of the market. So what then was done is to look at each of those stalls, what exactly did they sell? So here's an example. This is a poultry, a wholesale poultry stall that did sell uh, chicken and pheasants, but also a range of other animals, some of them live many of them from uh, farms in different parts in China, in, and particularly in, in southern uh, China. And that's relevant because that's also where the most closest bat viruses have been found. Now, in that whole endeavor, there was also an effort to try and, and paste together the genomes from the first known uh, cases. <clears throat> so these are all cases with onset of illness in December, the earliest possible uh, onset of illness uh, shown here. But as you can tell is that there already was considerable diversity there telling us this was not the, the start of the pandemic, that that lies 
earlier and when doing a um, time to most recent common ancestry analysis that timing uh, dated back to somewhere between November uh, and uh, early December, uh, mid-November and early December, so a couple of weeks earlier where, and, and missed. If you then add a, a bigger data set from the first cases uh, for the, for, uh, reported in December and January all over China and also beyond, uh, you see here those two initial same clusters, but you see a third one sitting in between where you wonder if that could be ancestral. And that's from a, an entirely different uh, province where there's very little known about uh, disease uh, patterns in the early months. So what we've recommended is to do similar studies in this region and the same here, a different province with a large cluster of uh, identical viruses identical to the uh, uh, early Wuhan cluster, uh, making you wonder what happened there um, uh, to try and, and, and understand where were the earliest cases. Recent paper this week, last week, uh, shed some, some uh, extra light on this. So the, the mapping of the market had been done by the time these, the first uh, notifications were done, so end of December. Uh, but by then the market was pretty empty uh, or emptied. Um, <clears throat> uh, but this uh, publication did for a very different uh, uh, disease uh, survey looked at wild animals uh, presence and abundance on markets in Wuhan between May and November. And that mapped uh, a lot of animals uh, belonging to 38 species smack on the market. So there definitely were live animals on that market, uh, including several uh, animal species that we now know are susceptible like raccoon dog, different types of badger, uh, hedgehogs um, and what have you, uh, civet cats. Now, the uh, the origin of those animals often is from these more southern uh, provinces, and that's relevant because the closest relative uh, of these viruses um, is um, uh, uh, found here, um, and. Uh, uh, recently, new viruses were identified from Cambodia, um, and it's important to realize that there's massive undersampling. So the, the, the sampling efforts have been quite targeted, uh, but there's, there's a big ge geography that really needs further uh, sampling. So based on this uh, work and a lot of other things that you can uh, read, we've put together this uh, sort of uh, pathway map that says, well, uh, you still can, can there's, there's several different hypotheses by which this pandemic uh, sparked and then amplified, uh, likely from an uh, animal origin, possibly then introduced through the food chain or through an intermediary host or through a laboratory. Uh, but based on the evidence that we have uh, seen so far, uh, our conclusion was the animal zoonotic, uh, direct or indirect, is the most likely uh, route. Uh, and we've done, uh, if recommended, follow up studies there. Okay, back. So now we are, uh, so that's really the start of the pandemic. Now we are looking uh, further. And of course, the massive uh, genome sequencing effort really helps. Uh, looking at the, the dissemination uh, patterns of these viruses through the sharing of data in uh, GIZAID, uh, the global uh, platform that had been developed for flu, but also at the, the request, well, strong request, demand <laughs> of China was also used uh, for SARS-CoV-2, and that is because there is a governance associated with it on what you can and cannot do with that data, which I think has helped. So that, that whole dissemination and the use of molecular data for that has also been quite uh, fascinating. So here's an example from our own situation. I was asked to also discuss maybe a bit of examples of where you sit at this science and policy interface. So this is one 
this is, uh, we had the first two cases, but we also had uh, clinicians from hospitals in the south of the country saying, well, it seems like we have many people with just mild colds. Uh, but this was also a couple of weeks after Carnival, which is a big party and then everyone has a cold. So question was, is, is this normal or something else going on? So over the course of one weekend, more than 1,000 healthcare workers were uh, tested and then uh, the viruses were sequenced. And you see here, here you have the central uh, clusters that, that I showed before, but you already see that by then we already had a wide, widely diverse uh, set of uh, virus, mycelium of viruses uh, circulating in the country not picked up by the clinical uh, based uh, case finding. Um, that same uh, uh, period, we also started to discuss uh, what else to consider. And one element of that was the potential for uh, spill back into animals. And that is uh, something, for instance, that is a concern with uh, influenza, has happened with every influenza pandemic. Um, and then you have viruses that continue to circulate and drift in the animal population to come back eventually and, and, and be receded. Um, and in that uh, endeavor, we said, well, let's include uh, mink, um, knowing there's a big mink farming industry, but also uh, because uh, ferrets um, are used as an animal model and uh, these animals are taxonomically related. And sure enough, in uh, April, we had the first uh, positive uh, mink, uh, where uh, you see here, these are in black, are the sequences from, from humans. And you saw seeding of these viruses into mink, uh, then mink farm to mink farm spread here, different colors, a different farm, and then back spread back into people. And that has happened on quite a few uh, occasions. So that of course triggered questions uh, whether or not these viruses then, uh, what, what we see is uh, an animal specific signature. Uh, not, um, from this, you don't know how relevant that is, but we, do, we did see that we could recognize people were getting infected with these viruses that were animal passaged. And then the question, of course, was, is that a continuing problem? So here you see now a circular tree with all the sequence data from human cases. Here's the five different uh, animal farm clusters. And in purple is sequences from cases that had been diagnosed uh, with uh, COVID from the same postcode area of the farms. And as you can tell, there really was no evidence for continued circulation. This was just uh, the, the regular diversity of viruses. Now within the farms and in the people uh, working on the farms, we did find uh, this, this specific signature and particularly with ongoing uh, circulation, uh, accumulation of mutations. So you have shown now in uh, alignments for the five different uh, clusters um, uh, and seeing that these viruses do evolve in uh, animal to animal and farm to farm uh, circulation. Uh, so that brings me then to the topic of variant. Uh, so on the farms, uh, we have seen the evolution of uh, variants that had changed binding properties and had some indication of antibody escape. Uh, so that has not been, you know, big news, but of course it is the whole variant business is a, a concern uh, right now and has, has um, become more and more important with the um, evolving vaccine effort. So what we're looking at now is, um, I think we, we are starting to see some light in the, the accumulating data from that big genomic effort combined with specific targeted studies, where you can see there is these clusters of mutations that seem to be associated with some 
different difference in phenotypes. There's mutations here from from uh, observed in people, but also in different animals. Um, in uh, uh, the receptor binding domain that affect the binding of the virus to the host, and by that maybe also uh, it provides some a, a changed uh, immune uh, uh, profile. Same here on this part of the protein, uh, also uh, similar uh, changes uh, associated potentially with immune escape, antibody escape, I should say. Uh, mutations here uh, around the furin cleavage site, which uh, seem to affect the cleavability and there, with that also maybe transmissibility and mutations uh, here that also have been associated with somehow with transmissibility. And this has happened before, but, but not in the spotlight. The first real um, uh, variant that popped up uh, was already very early on in February, March, when um, uh, the 614G uh, uh, mutation had not been seen in the viruses circulating in Asia so far, but really uh, became very rapidly became dominant in the uh, dissemination um, over Europe and the rest of the world. And by now almost all viruses have this particular uh, mutation. And in uh, follow-up studies, it, it now has been demonstrated that it's been associated with an increase in transmissibility as defined by the R value. Um, very important question then is how can you tell whether or not that is associated with disease severity differences? And that's a very tough question to answer. But uh, here, this is important work from the UK, COG UK uh, initiative. So that's the large scale genomic sequencing uh, initiative, which is done to a scale where they can actually ask these questions. So if you have patients in different age groups, with one uh, variant or the other at that particular mid, mid, uh, position, is there a difference in the case mix, uh, in the severity of the case mix? And as you can tell, uh, that was not the case. Um, uh, so, well, I can skip this one. Um, and uh, another question is then how do we, and that's a, a question that I think, uh, uh, needs more attention now is what is is there like a gold standard set of assays that you can do to really nail down comparatively whether or not a virus with specific sets of mutations that maybe is uh, remarkable from the epidemiology whether or not that really has uh, changed properties so one of the questions is uh, does that need to be done through, for instance, validation and transmission uh, studies, or is that really too difficult? Um, and of course, we are uh, looking at a continued uh, evolving uh, pattern. Um, that was the, uh, the 614G uh, uh, variant mutation. Since then, we've seen the variants that now are called alpha, beta, gamma, delta, and they make it to this list and to a listing as variant of concern if there is something weird in the epidemiology like almost simultaneous popping up in multiple countries and uh, displacement if you compare them with um, uh, the, re the initial virus population in specific regions. So right now, of course, we're all looking at the Delta variant and expecting to see that that will rapidly become dominant in Europe in the months to come. So big question there then is, is what do all these uh, viruses with mutations in different uh, spots where those are the mutations that people look at in the spike, but of course these are all in a, a complete backbone that also may have differences uh, but the big question, of course, is do vaccines continue to work against these variants? And uh, for that, it's important to consider looking at all components, of course, of the uh, immune system. So here's an example 
um, for looking at uh, virus neutralization tests in people that were infected and uh, vaccinated uh, or va vaccinated with, with and without prior uh, natural infection. So you see uh, all of them develop a uh, good uh, neutralizing antibody response, but people with previous natural infection um, have higher levels. And then if you look at, uh, do they affect um, uh, or, or do they uh, neutralize variant viruses to the same degree? I think the answer is for some yes and for others no. And here's the, uh, here you see clearly decreased neutralization of the um, uh, gamma variant, South African variant, but there's uh, also now uh, good evidence that similar picture is seen for the Delta uh, variant. However, is that a problem? Maybe yes, maybe no. Um, I think the efficacy studies are quite difficult to interpret because they are often done not, not comparatively. Uh, but so far, there is no clear effect on T cell responses that would, uh, that would further compromise the vaccine protection, uh, as far as I know. Um, so, I'm, I'm, I'm getting close to closing up. So if we go back to our question, what's, what lies ahead of us? What can we expect in the fall and in the winter? I do think it's critical that we realize that uh, we are in the lucky part of the world where we do have, uh, are, are starting to reach uh, such high levels of vaccine coverage that uh, that really uh, will slow down uh, circulation and also will particularly reduce the clinical impact, but uh, a large part of the world is not, uh, is not there yet and will not be there yet for another year or so. And uh, with that, I think we need to continue to prepare for possible escape uh, variants and what that does to our um, well sense of security. So that brings in the question, how much do you need in order to really hit uh, like um, uh, herd immunity threshold? It's a big topic. It has been uh, heavily debated. It's controversial in, at times. But this is related to the question, is there, um, uh, is it um, conceivable that these viruses can be eliminated? And the bottom line message here is that it's very unlikely because um, depending on where you live, if you have countries with a very <clears throat> high proportion of, of young uh, people, um, depending on the vaccine efficacy, which is related to, for instance, variants, um, it's, it's very rare that countries would actually reach this herd immunity threshold that would be really putting the brakes on uh, spread of this virus. Um, so ex we, uh, we're expecting continued circulation eventually in the, well, not entirely sure, but probably one of the viruses in the uh, uh, winter uh, co cold complex. Um, and it is really a global responsibility to make sure the world gets vaccinated. For the near future, I think this is our thing to watch out for. So we are seeing, uh, and of Portugal is seeing uh, flare ups, clusters of uh, cases, uh, particularly now with Delta variant um, in the not yet vaccinated uh, group that of course with the uh, relaxation of control measures is really eager to uh, get moving. Um, and what that could do is uh, shown here. This is a um, result from phy phylogenetic analysis done over the after the summer last year, where you see these branches on the tree uh, that were analyzed to see what seeded what, and where you could see that uh, returning holiday uh, goers really uh, reignited. Uh, a second wave uh, of uh, transmissions uh, in the, the late uh, period of the summer last year. And it's not entirely unlikely that this will happen again this year. 
clinical impact will be lower, but depending on how high the vaccine uptake has been. So uh, just to wrap up, um, uh, so we are seeing easing of control measures. I think I'm, I'm a fan have been for molecular epi studies, um, but uh, I think we need to start working out how to bring prediction from genomic data to a higher level because there's uh, lots of uncertainty there. Um, the origins of the virus and what exactly happened there uh, it remains important and the pandemic is not over yet. So here's my initial questions. What will the winter look like? Will we get a fourth wave? Likely. Um, there's some evidence of immune escape. The virus can probably not be eliminated. And the um, or origin, I still think the most likely scenario is zoonotic. So with that, I would like to just conclude and acknowledge the many uh, uh, partners that really ha have uh, worked on this uh, tirelessly, but also the uh, funding from uh, the different organizations that uh, make it possible for us to do this. Thank you very much, Mario. Um, the way this is going to work is we're not going to take questions now. Um, we will let Rui uh, be the next speaker. Um, but this was certainly very interesting and I already picked up on a few things. I did not read WHO report, I have to immediately admit. <laughs> uh, it's not my area of expertise, um, but clearly there are things in there that were in your presentation I had not picked up on that there is certainly a different location where you know there's a very limited amount of, of study done yet. Um, because one of my questions would have been how likely are we ever going to find the orig origin and actually if we maybe move our field of vision we might actually find it. Um, but sorry, Rui, I don't want to delay you. Um, the time is all yours um, to bring us up to speed with um, the epidemiology from, from your side. Thank you as well for accepting. You are still on mute. Oh, yeah. Okay. There you are. Sorry about that. Uh, a little bit of trouble. Uh, getting my sound on. Okay, thank you very much for the invitation. It's a great pleasure to be here, especially in such a distinguished company. And I think this is a, a, a very interesting complementarity after this beautiful talk by Marion on really modern field epidemiology with all the information it generates. I'm gonna talk a little bit more on classical theoretical <laughs> epidemiology. And what Mark asked me to to do was a little bit vague. It didn't give me very specific instructions. So my title is also um, uh, vague. Uh, and can you, okay, I saw that. Uh, and my title is also a little bit vague, but I thought that I definitely wanted to at least talk about R because I never, I never imagined that one letter would be so much talked about um, for such a long time. And it would be nice for all of us to be on the same page on that, perhaps. And I will start my stories, epidemiological stories, by actually epidemiological history. And you know, COVID-19 is only one of many, many uh, pandemics and epidemics that the world has seen. And perhaps uh, the first one that's well described or nicely described is the plague of Athens, more than two and a half thousand years ago, or two and a half thousand uh, years ago which was described a beautifully in a historical account in small excerpts from history of the Peloponnesian War by Thucydides, who was a very insightful writer, uh, even about um, uh, uh, the infections, not just about politics and war. And in fact, you know, this issue that we are still talking about, you know, is there gonna be another wave that with last year we were, uh, people are asking and really want to know, is there gonna be a second wave? Uh, in fact, Thucydides already mentioned that. He said the winter following the plague, a second time attacked the Athenians, for although it had never entirely left them, still it, there had been a notable abatement in its ravages. This is basically the description of a second wave coming, even though 
the waves that we see now are not, they have nothing to do with historically what infectious diseases um, uh, waves, I think, um, which were intrinsical dynamics of the infection. And now there's quite a lot of, of uh, uh, human behavior and, and, and policies to contain the epidemic. But this was not the only thing he said. He actually uh, set up, in some sense, the, the main questions that we have when we look at infectious diseases. He noticed that zones of higher population density had higher prevalence, which we now recognize is one of the most important things, like for instance, size of household is very important in, 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 in spreading epidemics. He noticed that prevalence in deaths occurred more frequently among caretakers or physicians of uh, ill people. And also he saw that the plague could be transported by the movement of troops. And this made him hypothesize that the disease could actually be passed from one infected person to another. And this was a revolutionary idea at the time, but it was unfortunately lost for more than 2000 years. We all know that for a long time, people thought that infections and diseases due to infections were because of, of something in the air or, or bad karma or revenge or something like that from the gods. And one can only imagine if these ideas had been explored and analyzed in more detail, starting this two and a half thousand years ago, how many lives and how, how much uh, the history of epidemics and pandemics would have been different. And also we noticed something which for an immunologist is, is critical. He noticed that people who recovered from the plague were resistant to being sick again. And then it's very insightful that, but they were not resistant to other diseases. This is immunological memory and specificity of, of memory. And so that is an amazing um, uh, 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 summary of the questions that still today we are interested in. And we, even though we might put them in a different context or framework, they're the same. Uh, and just to have an idea that COVID-19 is unique in the sense of the widespread impact that it has had, but in the last 40 years since HIV, there's a map here shows that there's many, 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 many cases of emerging and re-emerging infectious diseases, some of which became you know, global uh, pandemics like HIV or coronavirus. Others are still localized, were still localized epidemics, but also with a lot of uh, impact like Ebola or, or other uh, hemorrhagic fevers. But it was not until the 20th century when people started uh, thinking about these aspects of infectious diseases and thinking that quantifying them and, and, and having a, a, a good handle on the data and how the, all the different factors impacted uh, infectious diseases um, was also of interest. And actually perhaps one of the fathers of that movement was Sir Ronald Ross, who was the second uh, Nobel Prize winner in medicine and was the person who was able to convince the science uh, scientific community that malaria was transmitted by mosquitoes, who actually wrote um, that carefully, re carefully reasoned analysis of the disease and the various factors which influence it was very important to understand the spread of infection. And in fact, it, it coined a term we no longer use called pathometry, which is like the quantification of pathogen spread. And a few years later, um, the, the main concepts of uh, quanti quantitative epidemiology for infectious disease, mathematical epidemiology were set up by Kermack and McKendrick, who uh, were very famous in, in the field because they came up with um, an idea similar to the one that we use nowadays to model infectious diseases and to think about how they spread in quantitative terms. And the way we think about it is that we have the pool of people of population divided into compartments, as we call these compartment models. We have people who are susceptible to infection. When they come in contact with people who are infected um, or infectious, they become infected, and then these people recover. And this is what's so-called SIR models for susceptible infection recovers. This is a very simple a schematic of this model. Things, compartments can become more complex. We can add, you know, we know, for instance, for COVID-19 that unfortunately not everyone recovers, so some people die. We know that there are people who are infected but not yet infectious, they're incubating the disease, there's a, a class of exposed here, and there can be many other compartments. But the general basic principle is this, 
And many of the implications of the simple model are also seen in more complicated models. And I think that why this is so powerful is because we can write equations. And I'm not going to go into a lot of detail. Just say what this says is that the rate of change of the number of infected people, which is this term here, is given by how many people are coming in here minus how many people are going out here. And so this is these fluxes uh, tell us something about how the number of infected people are going to increase or decrease. And these parameters of these fluxes, you know, this gamma or something, which is the, the, the rate of recovery for an infected person, are really of interest to, to estimate for us to understand these diseases. But this simple model predicts the following. The number of susceptibles will stay stable for a while, then decrease very quickly. The number of infected will come up and then be controlled, and the number of recovered uh, goes up and stays up. So this, this simple model already gives us three ideas that we've been, again, talking about um, uh, quite a lot. One is, even though I plotted this in a linear scale, we have this initial growth, which is exponential. So it's a really fast increase in the number of infected individuals. And there is this idea, even today in Publico, you can read the comment by Manuel Carmo Gomes, who I, most of you may have heard of him, an epidemiologist that says that it looks like, off, this is how uh, infection spreads. It looks like nothing is happening and suddenly there's a very quick uh, incre increase in the numbers. And that's what an exponential growth uh, is. Um, the second thing you see is that the infection, you know, it has a wave. This is a wave. This is a single wave because it's a very simple model, but that's the idea. It comes up and then it goes away. So that, that's where the waves come from. And then the third thing is that it, the infection goes away even before everyone is infected. So from the whole susceptible population here in blue, which in this example is a million people, there's still 200,000. So 20% of the people actually never got infected. Uh, and this is going to be related to the, um, this is going to be related to uh, this concept of herd immunity. But this uh, also has another, uh, this simple model also gives us another uh, important outcome. What happens if you reduce the number of susceptibles? If we have the initial number of susceptibles, we have this wave. If we have a reduced number of susceptibles, we have this other uh, line for the number of infected people. And this is nothing else than flattening the curve, which we heard so much last year. This flattening the curve is this, is to remove, to lower the number of susceptible people. And we do that, for instance, by uh, telling people, confining, telling people cannot go out, cannot meet with other people. And that has this advantage of uh, reducing the number of, of, of the peak number of people at any one time. Another thing I'd like to mention is what happens on the other hand, if you have more susceptibles. So here is again, the number of susceptibles the number of infected people. Now it's in the logarithmic scale here. So you can really see it's a straight line, the increase in the number of people in a logarithmic scale. That's what an exponential increase is. And uh, we have this. Now I'm going to increase the number of susceptibles in the population by tenfold. And what do we see? This is the curve for the number of infected. And what we see, and this is just an idea for everyone to think about, is that if we increase the number of cells by tenfold over a, a, a long time until actually we have an impact on the number of susceptibles and they start decreasing, there is no difference in the number of infected people. Now, what does this say for the way rules have been made based on uh, ratios? You know, if you have more than a certain number of people per under thousand infected or per million infected, in fact, what you can see is that small countries and big countries could very well have initially the same number of infected people. But if you're a small country, you're gonna have, in this case, tenfold more uh, people infected per 100,000 or per million, uh, even though your epidemic is exactly going on the same path. And in fact, for many, many, uh, for a long, long time, the country in Europe with the most number of cases per million was Luxembourg, because they had only 620,000 people about the size of Lisbon. Of course, this is a simplified version. Things are more complicated. Uh, this is a simple model. There's heterogeneity. Here I'm assuming there's complete homogeneity that everyone anywhere can be infected by people, etc. So 
this is just you know food food for thought that says that sometimes using these very simple uh, numbers uh, uh, is not the full story. But I wanted to go and talk about R. And R has two versions. R not. It's called a basic reproduction uh, number. And this really comes from this uh, equation. So the number of infected people, infectious people, changes in time according to this uh, formula, which is just a rewriting of what, what I had shown you before. And what this shows is that this number, so the, the number of people is, are going to increase when this is larger than zero, so when this is positive, and this is positive when R0 is larger than one. On the other hand, the number of infected people are going to decrease uh, when this number is negative, and this number is going to be negative when R0 is lower than one. Uh, so this means that we have uh, that R is this threshold behavior. When, it, when the, the value of R is above one, the infection will spread. When the value of R0 is uh, below one, the infection will contract, the epidemic will contract. This is not uh, simply um, uh, 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 a, a property of, of the disease, it's also the proper, a property of where it's spreading. In this case, it's called R0 because we're assuming that everyone is susceptible. So, so it's at the beginning of the epidemic. And R0, even though such a simple concept, is actually uh, been studied and is very central in, in epidemiology, quanti quanti uh, quantitative epidemiology. And it's the subject of the thesis with the shortest name that I've ever known. It's a thesis, thesis by Hans Histerbeek, also of the Netherlands, who I think Marion also knows who wrote a thesis not, uh, called R0. So a letter in the sub, subscript. And if you look at uh, different virus, this has been calculated and these are indicative values. Um, they can be anything, you know, they're all above one because otherwise they, the, the disease would not spread. A anything from 1.6 or so to measles, one of the most contagious infectious diseases, it's above 14. And SARS-CoV-2, um, you know, initially was was mentioned about three, but there's some estimates that go up to six, uh, and maybe it depends on the variants, depends on the population that's spread, and the way that the calculations are made. And so R0 is this threshold behavior. When it's above one, you have spread of the infection. When it's below one, we have contraction of the infection. But it has other properties. And one of the properties is that we can calculate what is the threshold of people that we need to remove from the susceptible population so that the, the infection will not spread. And that's given by one minus one over R0. So let's say if R0 is two, this will be one minus one half. So we need to take away 50% of the people from the population. So the famous number of we need to reach 70% of the population to have already vaccinated to have herd immunity comes from the idea that if R0 is about three, then this will be about seven, uh, you need to remove about 70% of the people from the, the population uh, to, to have the, the, the infection contract, so reduce over time. And it seems, especially when you hear the news, that there is a misunderstanding. It's not like we're going to reach 70% and the epidemic and the, and the virus will go away and there will be no more virus now. It means that growing of the virus and growing of the number of infected cases will be more difficult, but there will still be outbreaks. The virus, as uh, the previous talk so clearly showed, most likely will be endemic. We can have people infected. We can have outbreaks. There will be people going to hospital. There will be, unfortunately, deaths and so forth. This is just a, a, a number, uh, a, a threshold that will make it more difficult for the virus to spread. And if R0 is six, for instance, then we, you do this calculation and you reach the conclusion that herd immunity threshold is at 85%. So you need to get there. And if vaccine is not given to children, for instance, um, which is not approved yet in, in, in many countries, or if people don't take, it's, it's much harder to get the last 15% of the population than you know, the first 15% or the second or the third or even the fourth 15% of the population. So that's just um, another reason why R0 is simple. And then the other flavor of R that we have heard, it's so-called RT, 
but often uh, the one that we hear on the news and it's in the famous matrix that they use in Portugal, it's just called R, is what we'd call the effective reproduction number. And this it means it's the, it's the same idea as the reproduction number, but now when we are in the presence of a, a population which is no longer totally susceptible. So some people have been infected, some people have been vaccinated, et cetera, uh, or we are in confinement or, or what, what, what have you. So not everyone is susceptible. And this is a much harder number to estimate because it's changing all the time. And so, uh, but it, 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 it's crucially, essentially estimating how many people are still susceptible or at any one moment are susceptible. And trying to estimate this is, as I said, it's art. There's many different ways. It's something that I was uh, worried about and interested about you know, more than 13 years ago, 15 years ago. Again, Manion and Hans Easterbeek and other people have also proposed different ways. Again, at the time, I and them were worried about uh, avian influenza and, and the spread of avian influenza, uh, which is com a completely different issue because it has only little flares of infection without really spreading. Nowadays, this is so common, so important, and again, uh, something I never thought would be so much in the news and in the public's mind that you can go to any data aggregator like our world in data, and it, it actually uh, has the calculations or the, the aggregation of the R RT, so this effective reproduction number for a number of countries. And I'll show a few graphs of this sort, and here I chose a few countries that are close or relevant to Portugal, like France, Italy, Spain, or United Kingdom, and in other countries which are about the same size uh, as Portugal, uh, all in Europe, Belgium, Czechia, the Netherlands, uh, and Sweden. And these are the curves. Portugal is here in a thicker line in black. And we can clearly see you know, what happened in January with the huge increase, the enormous effect that um, um, uh, the confinement measures in, in the middle end of January had on controlling RT. And we can also see the other thing, which is uh, on the cover of Publico today as well, which is Portugal's encounter cycle to the rest of Europe. When Europe was increasing, we were decreasing. Uh, Europe now is decreasing. In general, we're increasing. There's the United Kingdom here, and this is probably also related to the Delta variant, which was spoken about uh, already quite a bit. So I don't want to talk more. So, but RT is not the only thing that tells us about the control of infection. There's another very, very important aspect that I just wanted to mention, which is really uh, probably what made SARS-CoV-2 uh, such a difficult infection to control. And that is the proportion of infections that occur before a person has any symptoms. And so here is a, a graph where we have on one axis here R. So as the, the higher the R is, the faster uh, a virus will spread, but also here the proportion of infections that occur before a person has symptoms. And SARS-CoV-1, you know, this outbreak in 2002-2004, was controlled, quote unquote, more or less easily, almost for sure, because the vast majority of infections occurred after a person had symptoms. And once you have symptoms, you are less likely to go to a party or to a concert or go to work or contact other people. And so quarantine and control is much more efficient. For SARS-CoV-2, uh, there's been many numbers from 80% of infections occurring in people who don't have symptoms yet, but you know, it's gonna be a much larger uh, number, uh, a fraction. And so this makes it really, really hard to control because people have most of that transmission probably before they even know they're infected. So I'll just look at some numbers of the epidemic in Portugal in the context of other European countries and also uh, give us a little bit more of it. So this is just the total number of cases per million as it is uh, customary to represent. Again, we can see what happened in Portugal in January and then the stabilization. But these are the officially reported numbers. Um, it's important to know that every time people have looked, uh, not just us in Portugal, but in other countries, uh, there's been many more people who seem to have been infected, most likely were infected because they have antibodies than the number of reported people. And so, as Mark mentioned, we did, we, uh, it means, you know, EMM, IMM and uh, the School of Medicine, but also uh, 
with the help of Laboratório Germano de Souza and a, a clinical research organization, CTI, did a, a large study uh, back in September with more than 13,000 people um, that were uh, tested for serology and look at the, at the true prevalence in some sense of uh, the infection in Portugal. And what we could see is this light gray is the number, the fraction of people of different age categories for females and males that we uh, detected antibodies in versus the number of people for the same categories uh, that have officially reported cases. And we could see that especially in young people up to 20, there was nine times more people that had been infected than that actually been reported. For older age groups, this number varied between two and four approximately. And this is just telling you that there's a lot of, there are a lot of people who are infected and they're probably never tested uh, and they never uh, become reported. Why that happens is a, a question to understand um, 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 uh, human behavior and also infectious, the, the, the biology of infection. I, I think I should say, you know, at least that the people involved in this study at IMM were Andrea Gomes, Marta Serrano, Patricia Napoleão, Inês Domingos, Claudia Silva, Julia Fengsal, Angela Afonso, Andrea Lopes, Yonela Toder, Maria Mota, Bruno Silva Santos, Mark, uh, and myself. And so there's a lot of people, was a lot of work and a lot of uh, logistics to put these things together. This is the number of, of deaths per million in the different countries. And we can see that Portugal was relatively uh, in low numbers up to you know what happened in December and January, and we all seen the images and then uh, the case, uh, uh, the number of deaths increased a lot. And this often is, is translated uh, into a case fatality ratio, meaning the number of, of deaths per cases reported. And this is where Portugal uh, is in the middle of uh, these, all these other countries. Independently of what I was seen in the beginning, this is more or less stabilized now. And, and again, uh, there's sociology here and, and there's defin the definitions of deaths by COVID. So what is a death by COVID is different in different countries and that has a, a big impact in these numbers. If instead of looking at the case fatality ratio, which is the number of people uh, deaths per people reported, we looked at the infection fatality ratio, which is the number of people who died, reported death with COVID divided by the total people who have been infected, including his antibody serology, we did a a second uh, follow-up study in March. And uh, so after this big wave we had in January, an infection fatality ratio was about 1.2%, which is still, you know, it's a very high uh, infection fatality ratio. But again, this is not the whole picture. It is very, very variable by age and even by sex. So again, light gray is female and male. And in older people, infection fatality ratio is eight, 9%. Uh, with quite larger value for males and females. And then in younger people, it's you know, uh, uh, one per thousand, these numbers are per thousand, okay? So one or two per thousand or 0 0.1 per thousand. So it's, it's completely different. And then just to show for completeness what vaccination is looking like in all these countries, we see that more or less all European countries with this European Union uh, being uh, trying to coordinate all the efforts are more or less all at the same pace. The UK, you had a different uh, strategy, of course, at a much larger uh, early on. And talking about antibodies, I would be remiss if I didn't just show a couple of slides on, on what we measured. And I think the good news, and Mark's team did a lot of work to, to get this data, uh, we had, uh, in this here, 188 people who, whom we quantified the um, IgM, IgG, and IgA against spike uh, 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 in the blood back in September when we did the first part of the study. We had robust response in basically uh, you know, a, a lot of people, almost everyone. Um, and what is interesting and what's important to note is that every single one of these 188 people, when they were measured again in uh, March, they, they still had very robust and almost barely uh, uh, lower 
levels of IgM, IgG, and IgA. So there's very, this is a robust response, which is maintained for a long time. Of course, there's an issue whether uh, these are neutralizable, neutralizing antibodies or not, and also whether uh, new variants escape or not uh, this, but the immune response is, is very strong. And then just to show another thing uh, that's relevant is that if we look at people who in, in October, in September, had been infected for a short period of time, less than four months, and then these people were looked again in March, yes, we do see a slight decay, which is significant uh, in, in IgM, IgG, and IgA. But if we look at, at the people who in September had been infected, but for a longer time, so notice that these people, the first time they were measured, they were already four or six uh, or more months after uh, their infection. And these are people from whom we know approximately the date of infection, either to a positive test or um, uh, symptoms. These people show no decaying of antibodies. What this is indicating is that we initially, after the, the infection, you mount immune response, there's a certain contraction of the immune response, but then it's stable for you know, some of these people more than 12 months, more than a year. So this, in some sense, is good news, and it, it, it it's also uh, reflects what was said in the previous talk. So, you know, this is, uh, this is a little bit of theory and numbers, but, and I know that now there's many, many more epidemiologists than I ever imagined that there would be in the, uh, everywhere, in the news and not only, but, you know, doing quantitative epidemiology in practice is a little bit more complicated. We need to understand the biology of infection, and I barely said anything about the biology of infection, but it really goes at least into interpreting the results and interpreting and, and making proper models. The data of field epidemiology, especially classical data, we have this amazing uh, presentation in before uh, uh, by Marion showing the enormous efforts on, on phylogenetic data, and it's probably the future where we get the most consistent and objective data. But the data of number of people infected, number of deaths, everything, is really bad and trying to do uh, modeling or, or predictions based on that is very hard. That, that's not what we do for um, the weather, for instance, or economics or something like that. We have good data for that. There's international systems to collect that data. I think this is one thing that we have to improve. And there has been a lot of improvements since the even influenza scare and, and the 2009 influenza uh, pandemic. And, and many also mentioned the efforts of the WHO for that, and that's an improvement, but I think we can still do much better. Then there's issues, what can be observed and what cannot be observed, but I think like the number of, of underreporting of true cases, but what I think has really been important and really shown uh, in, this, in this epidemic is human behavior. And I think that the waves that we see, most of the waves that we see, are related to human behavior in many, many different countries, in many different places. What you see is that when the number of cases go up, people get scared, the governments impose restrictions, but the people also restrict themselves. And when the number of cases go down, then people uh, feel more comfortable. The governments also relax restrictions, and then the numbers come up again. And that's going to happen until we have a very sizable proportion of the people removed from the susceptibles, either through vaccination or through uh, infection itself. So in the end, I think, at least in these terms of quantitative bio, uh, epidemiology, I like to say we're still in the beginning. And Ronald Ross already in 1911 said that these studies are required to be developed much further so that we can, they can be useful and help to suggest a more precise and quantitative consideration on numerous factors concerned in epidemics. He said at the time, and maybe it's still a little bit true, although not to the same extent as 1911, and expressing the good thing, he said at present, medical ideas regarding these factors are generally so nebulous that almost any statement about them past muster and often retard or misdirect important preventive measures for years. And there has been a lot of, of, of uh, uh, information issues also during this current pandemic. So I'll just finish and leave it here. You know, all the volunteers for the, for the serology part, all the volunteers of the serology study, Biobanco at IMM that you know, controlled all the samples and then the funding. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Rui.
Um, I think for, for both speakers, it was really good to see how we put um, science facts and, and definitions back into um, what we're dealing with. Um, I will open this for any questions. Um, I saw somebody had to leave earlier who already posted a question. I will post that in a moment. I just want to pick up on one thing, Louis. When you showed your, your graphs, um, which is just an example, let's say there are a million people that, that can be infected. In the end, 200 of 200,000 of them do not get infected. This is a theory that goes, that is around for a long time. For example, it's one of these used that bio warfare will never work because there's always a certain percentage that. Uh, how do we interpret that? Is that true that because of genetics, we are such an outbred uh, population that there are some of us that are just not susceptible? No, this is this is without that. I mean, I mean, eighty percent of the population being infected is still a very thing. I think for <laughs> war, it would be you know. There's also studies that show after thirty, if you wipe out thirty percent, and in fact, you know, the Peloponnesian War, one of the reasons why. Uh, the, the, the war course was changed was because of the plague, who kill, which killed 25 to 30 percent of the Athenians, which is basically devastated. But anyway, but here, it, this is a purely dynamical thing. So this is a simple model. Things are obviously more complicated, but it's a purely dynamical thing. Here, all the susceptibles are equally susceptible. I'm not saying that some people are resistant more than others. But it's it just that eventually it just becomes difficult to meet those people fast enough because they're few and far between. And so for the infected people to meet those people becomes hard. And so, you know, that's the interpretation. So there's a question that was posed earlier, um, Marion, for you. Um, first of all, to thank you for the talk, um, but especially what is your view on the single dose vaccines um, that now are, you know, the, the Johnson & Johnson? Um, do they, you think, provide enough protection against the Delta variant? Um, as for the two dose variant, the two dose injections seem to, you know, you get antibody maturation, etc., seem to be more robust, um, at least for the recent publications. Yeah, so there's the single dose of a two dose vaccine story, which is what, for instance, the UK has uh, done, or at least. Uh, there we know, so if you look at Pfizer, Moderna, Astra, that the, there is a, a reasonable clinical protection, so protection mm. from severe disease already from three weeks onwards after the first dose. But if you look at then at the Im immunological markers, it's really wimpy. So, and there you really see with the second dose, a very strong uh, boosting. And then you see the, the levels and also the bandwidth that allows you some uh, antibody escape. Mm -hmm. in, uh, the, in, in, in there, there's now a paper uh, online preprint uh, that has looked at um, uh, vaccine efficacy for Delta variant in the UK and finds that to be after one dose, uh, I think it's 20% points lower than, uh, 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 than for the other variants. So that's really a clear tangible uh, difference. And that difference is far less after the booster. So that's one. Whether Janssen, so of course the Janssen uh, vaccine has, uh, and there's, there's others, uh, has claimed that the efficacy is similar and it has had some, uh, some data to that degree. But um, I think that's still a question that I would like to see raised and addressed. How, how good is that? Uh, so for the uh, for the variants, they do they do start to challenge the level of protection from yeah the whole mix from antibodies. I I, I don't think there's any evidence for T cell escape, uh, but there's clear evidence for antibody well reduced um, uh, antibody effects. Uh, we don't know how important one or the other is, but um, uh, for Janssen, I think uh, we need we need to understand that. I don't have questions coming up here on the moment. Because um, the other thing I, I'm very interested in, um, 
I remember when I interacted, um, and this is completely outside of a pandemic, so this is not too really comparable. I have interacted with some politicians, so some members of parliament when I was in the UK, and I found it a little bit disconcerting at the time that sometimes their attention span to basic facts was a little bit short. Um, now, of course, this is a different situation. Um, so how does it, how do you advise politicians or, or authorities in that sense? And, and, and I'm not fishing for particular examples. It's more as a bunch of scientists, do you come to an agreement what your collective advice is or politicians or other uh, uh, interested parties are sitting in in sessions and are really making up the, I mean, in the end, it's the politicians that decide. Um, there is no, no, no doubt about that. But do they, do they feed on maybe some parts in the discussion that could go two ways or you get a really a collective advice saying this is as a as a, an organization or as a panel is what we advise to do and then it's up to them if they do it or not so i think it's different in different countries so um in our country there's a national outbreak management team and uh, which has experts um and it gets, uh, so it, it is a bit self-tasking and it gets questions from politicians. Uh, we want to know about this, that, and the other thing. And then the, so in that group, we review the data, the, the modeling, the, the trends, the, what, you know, the projected effect of different uh, measures. And based on that, and with, you know, sometimes you don't really have the data as, as, as you pointed out. But then based on the discussion, say what is the most likely, least likely, uh, and, and then recommend based on that. And that gets fed to a different group, which is the, um, the well, uh, responsible at the political, political level, but also the, the, the city uh, councils and things like that. So that's how it's done in our country occasionally so these things then are debated in parliament and then the the chair of our committee is there to also present the data but it's very much the this is our advice the choices are yours okay yeah and i mean again there will be a um a responsibility that is not the scientists it's, it's, it's the politicians um and then of course you will get the comments um, so how, how do you deal with the comments that come later, generally from the public, um, partially because they may not disagree with what the politicians have done, um, but the, the advice is based on, on facts and science. Um, how much frustration is there with, I mean, and I'm talking about you in particular, but in, in, I mean, because I find it sometimes almost infuriating when I see things that are so twisted and, and, and really out of context. Um, do you respond once in a while or you just prefer to stay completely out of it? No, 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 no. So I think there is, so it's clear that there's a lot of questions and well, how does this work and blah, blah, blah. So that I think is also a role for scientists. Mm -hmm. Explain in a scientific mm -hmm. way, explain the process, explain the uncertainties. Uh, of course, what you have out there is then, then there, and that, that was something that I heard from uh, a, a person who led an initiative, putting all sorts of stakeholders around the table on how are we going to deal with the North Sea? There's, there's tourism, there's fisheries, there's uh, energy, uh, mm -hmm. you know, generation, things like that. And he said, I can find a scientist for any position, for any. Yeah. So and that's why, where I think as a scientist, you have to be very careful because it's easy to say, oh, but this is how it is. But you do, it, it's such a complex, unless it's really, really your specific field, but it's such a complex puzzle that, uh, you know, I think modesty, is important mm -hmm. you know and and really saying yeah well this is how we think this is what we've seen this is what we don't know and uh, th so there's lots of people that uh, you can discuss with like that also even you know with with schools with um, and that's i think is fine 
it's more difficult if you have people that really are on this i know how it is and you are the criminal or i know mm -hmm. this theory and you're just making all these mistakes and you're killing people that's very difficult yeah. i mean i have to say here we had um it's it's i can't even remember it must be a, a, more than a month ago we had 400 zoom sessions for members of the public with with scientists to try to explain exactly those, yeah. those kind of things which nicely leads me on to sarah's question is um her question is if you have natural antibodies from um, passing the disease so you got infected first they recommend to wait for three months to get the vaccine but now with the delta variant um, to be really fully protected um should you now get the vaccine sooner, um, especially um, for somebody who is over fifty? It's 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 a it's a difficult. Yeah, have... I think uh, so. It's not like uh, these viruses jump at you. I mean, there's different things you can do. So the the um, so, but I think. Booster vaccinations, if you have a three months inter, uh, interval uh, after infection, uh, they are for a reason because immunologically that's a good timing. Uh, well, you know more about that than I do, but I don't think there's much against a, an earlier booster, but not too early, I would say somewhere from six weeks onward. But it's also important to recognize that um, there's a, there is also protection from infection, um, but vaccination will really boost that immunity. There's several studies now that have shown that. So it is recommended, uh, but it's not like non-protected if you have the nat had natural infection. Plus, I don't know about your country, but in our country, we will continue to have like s some form of distancing, uh, you know, use your head. Yeah, I'm, I'd say the data we, we have to, together with Rui as well is we had um, somewhat limited amount of people that got uh, naturally infected um, from six months uh, before since we tested the antibodies, etc. And after vaccination, you get a really nice boost of antibodies. Yeah. Really nice. Um, and a lot and of I've people... Seen Sorry, uh, I've seen one study here in, in the Netherlands that has done that and uh, up to 15 months and so virtually no decline okay. in the natural antibodies. So that's yeah. pretty good. Yeah, yeah, I think I think there cannot be any doubt. Um, and I think with many immunologists that there was not that much doubt, if, even March 2020, that you will make a good response um sure we were not sure how long that would be but um it was reasonable to assume this would be many months um and i think we can now say it, it is not not unlikely it will be a few years um, where you have good levels of antibodies still circulating um we did not measure neutralization activity um so that's it's a shortcoming of, of, of what we did at the time but the boost is there and it will probably for months protect you from from reinfection for you know the average person and, and again yeah um, but this is where the so you have a distribution right of titles and um uh, so if you sh uh, so the higher that is the the more of a shift you can accommodate if yeah. there is a variant that yeah that's less neutralizable so if you have a shift, for instance, with the uh, gamma variant or the delta variant, uh, starting from just high levels, you will still be over that whatever threshold. We don't know the correlate, of course, but at least you will have still have uh, you know considerable. I think, uh, I, I think it's particularly have, yeah, interesting. You, know, the, you have, like was mentioned before, the T cell, other branches of the immune system, not just the antibodies, that seem to be also important and, and, and very good at controlling other infections. Yeah, I, th yeah, I think what's, so what's, far... what's interesting, those people that, that have um, a mild or a, a largely asymptomatic infection, um, we saw that already in September, those are the ones with the, with the lower titers. Yeah. Um, yeah. And they, those will benefit the most. And you will see it again, we, we did a, a local study. Um, there are many people that now have antibodies because we did come to wave two and three, which were very significant here, um, that never knew they were infected. 
Um, and they probably are the ones that, um, with again, with exceptions, but of course, on average, they will not have the highest titus now and they will benefit hugely um, from the vaccine, yeah. absolutely. That's why there's been a discussion whether or not you should pre-screen people before the yeah. vaccination. And we just said, no, if you look at the trials, there's really an added benefit from vaccination also if you've been yeah. through a natural infection. And yes, I agree. There's of course the antibodies is only just a tiny bit of the whole story, but there is so far to my knowledge, uh, no indication whatsoever of T cell escape. Yeah. I mean, the, the, the number of epitopes in the T in, in, in spike alone um, is significant. Um, and you, you don't just escape that. Um, you, you might be able to escape that in many years, um, but not certainly not yeah. in, in, in months with, with, with new, new variants. Um, and it's kind of, um, that's kind of what we hypothesized last year. Um, it's probably beneficial when your neutralizing antibodies drop a bit at some point and you do get reinfected and now you get reinfected you don't really get ill but you now get new immunity um, you boost it to all the, pr the proteins from the virus um, and any variant which is then there on that moment in time immediately you have new immunity um, and of course that's kind of where and we at least hypothesize things are going um, because that's what happens very frequently with you know the four known human uh, coronaviruses although I would certainly not on this moment call SARS-CoV-2 a cold virus uh, and we will see it it, it yeah, might go there yeah. but it's not there for sure yeah, yeah. And it will take some time still okay if there yes, are no there was, uh, sorry there was this study um, yesterday, or report really from Public Health England, yes. showing that you know they had looked really uh, at, at reinfections after natural infection, and there are very very small numbers, you know, and uh, zero point four percent, and none of those people had had uh, symptomatic or or at least needed hospitalization which is very impressive, which tells you that natural infection does give you, and now they didn't have enough time to look at potential reinfection with D, um, sorry, with Delta uh, variant, but we'll see. Problem is it's such a numbers game, right? If yeah, you yeah. know if there's a small shift in that severe part of the pyramid, right. it's very, very hard to know. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So um, maybe I can make a comment on, yeah, on the other thing about absolutely. talking to the politicians and, yeah, and, and yes. things. Just, just, just very quickly. It's not so much about. I actually think that an important part um, of miscommunication and misunderstanding is that many people don't understand necessarily how science progresses or how science is made or knowledge is accumulated. You know, even the scientific, the form of scientific process or something like that. But there's also not an int not an interest in people of, of I think of about knowing that or of scientists as about talking about that. And I've mm -hmm. talked to schools, to high schools, in like in, in programs and things like that. And I propose, do you want me to talk about HIV vaccines or do you want me to talk about the scientific method and other things? And every time people want to talk, want to hear about some specific thing. You want to hear about COVID or you want to be hear about, you know, in this case, HIV vaccines, or people want to hear about some specific topic and not about this general thing. And then of course, uh, there's this issue for, for anything, I agree, it's in COVID that's clear, there's a scientist with a, a, every different opinion or someone who, who you can call a scientist with a different opinion on, on the topic and, and understanding that sociology or that that just it would be important. And now it's, but it's, uh, it's, so it's something for IMM, IMM and if someone from communication is out there <laughs> to think about, you know, how do you go at this try to thing? And I must say, I've I've made proposals before that have not gone very far. It's um, clear there is an enormous public appetite for knowledge on the moment. Um, right now, yeah. So maybe we need to ride this wave. It it is the right time. Yes, um, people have never been as interested in antibodies or knowing the level of <laughs> antibodies as or before. Are. <laughs> or are and, and oh, absolutely or mutants. Or, or mutants and variants and yeah, and, yeah. <laughs> but, but let me give an example i mean many cultural organizations i can say you know uh, have organized uh, 
courses and workshops on and cinema, history, Egyptian culture, everything. But it's really hard to convince someone to do something on science or the scientific method. Now maybe it's a time to 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 tell those people. I mean, I know several people in Portugal, uh, several I mean several organizations in Portugal that organize these types of courses, and they're always full. But it's hard to convince them to do one on on science. And I think that is an we opportunity do have now. Theaters that run programs. Yeah, yeah, or, exactly. Um, festivals that run programs. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I have to say there are a few things. Um, there is a, a pint of science here as well. Um, I've done that in the UK. Um, for example, the, the Cambridge Science Festival is good. Um, but of course, you do, do get a select amount of people. You only yeah. get people that think already about science, find it interesting. And first of all, it, and se or secondly, it's Cambridge. So it, it, <laughs> there is nothing else in the whole town but science. Or um, the Cheltenham Science Festival, I have done as well. That is much more interesting. Um, you feel quite exposed because it's quite a large audience. Um, it's very professionally organized. Um, and most of the people that are there are actually paying entry. So you really feel you need to deliver something. Um, but this is moderated by a journalist. And I think that's very important. On the moment you use jargon, the journalist will immediately pretty much punish you on stage that you don't do that again. So you avoid going into jargon that is specific for your profession, your area, or, et cetera, and is asking probing questions, not so much to undermine what you're saying, but probing questions to make the public understand really what you're saying. Um, so it's not you know, really coming back. So, okay, what do you really mean? Um, and how does this really work in, in, in practice? Because you know, we know our profession, but we, we, we always skip sometimes through methods and, and, and things right. like that. Um, I, I've done that. Um, <laughs> it was good fun, but when you're there and in, in like a green room situation where you suddenly see journalists that you normally only see on TV, it's a bit scary as well. <laughs> I imagine. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, oh, my son lives there, so. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, I, I saw that, but um, are they going to close the travel again, right? Or that has closed already? Yeah. 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 Delayed. Okay. Delayed. Delayed. Yeah. Okay. I don't see more questions. There, there's a um, question here. There, there's uh, a question here from. It's not in the question and answers in the chat. Okay. I didn't see it. Sorry. Um, can you pose it to her? Oh yeah, so the question from Sophia is that CDC is reporting a significant number of breakthrough infections in the US after being fully vaccinated, 10,000 over 100 million, of which 995 patients were known to be hospitalized and 160 patients died. I'm curious about, I'm curious what you think about these numbers. Um, I, you know, I can tell you my opinion, but maybe Marion's opinion is more relevant here. But, um, you know, as, as it was said before, this is a numbers game. 10,000 of 100 million infections is actually a very, very small number. You know, it's much less than what you expect from seeing in the clinical trials. Because that's 10 to the, well, as far as it's 0.1%. This would mean 99.9% .9 efficacy. So there must be more, actually, than these. It's not a lot. And having then 10% of that number hospitalized and 2% of the number that is a really small number. And you have to see there are people very, very, you know, variable susceptibilities, other comorbidities and so forth. So we cannot expect, I think, that vaccines or herd immunity or even endemic, when this becomes endemic, if that's the, that there won't be any deaths, there won't be any infections, there won't be an outbreak. So I think setting us up for that, if, it's uh, it's setting up for failure. It's not going to be that, I think. Yeah, so we have some intermediary data on vaccine effect efficacy now from the rollout, national rollout, where you do see an age effect. So in the right. older yeah. age groups, uh, even with uh, Pfizer, it's more around 70% than the 95% that you see in younger age groups. Um, and that's more to be expected. I mean, the, the, the numbers were so, so astronomically high. Right. 
that uh, so we have recommended well use them in the elderly because there's no vaccine that gives that level of um, efficacy in, in trials. Now in reality, it seems to be a bit lower. And so we do see uh, clusters breakthroughs in, uh, for instance, nursing home, vaccinated nursing home residents, but um, the proportion with severe disease is really low, but it's not zero. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I'll, I mean, that's, that's also what you finished with. Um, there will be a fourth wave, and, and, but hopefully that fourth wave is largely cases and, and, and much reduced in hospitalizations and especially reduced in fatalities. Um, but yeah, it's probably um, that we can go out, there won't be lockdowns and things like that, but common sense, avoiding large gatherings, especially when we go back to the winter season, um, keeping some distance, uh, being watchful indoors. I don't think we will completely get rid of that in within the next season. Um, hopefully thereafter and with, with, with vaccinations going out uh, in the rest of the world, that might improve again. Okay, yes. it's, it's late, it's, it's a quarter to five already. Um, so I really want to thank everybody for attending now. And um, of course, I hope the, the ones who will watch this later that they have enjoyed it and they found, found it informative. Um, I really want to thank you, Rui, and you, Marion, for a, an excellent talk and, and, and really nice discussion. Um, we will stay online a little bit longer, um, but for this, I will say goodbye. And um, thank you again. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. I really enjoyed it. All right, so who is